Jai Hind and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achin to this part three of our discussion on China, where the modern king of China, Xi Jinping, or probably the one that he wants to, uh, the king that he wants to crown himself, if I may, with the third term coming up. Let's learn about the more the thought process of Xi Jinping, how he came into power, and to the point where the the Chinese system finds itself today. To discuss this, as you can see, I have with me Major General Rajiv Narayan, who's here with his in-depth presentation to teach us about China. Sir, thank you so much for joining me for this part three. Uh, thank you, Adi, for uh, keeping me on. Now, this part three is the essence that everyone will look forward to. We have seen the strategies that have been evolved, how the foundation was made. And it's very interesting. I term it as the Xi era. What were the circumstances under which he rose to power? Because he was not the first choice, but how did he come about? Uh, what are the challenges that he is now facing? While his first term was relatively smooth, through his second term, there is a lot of challenges that he has faced and he is going to face now. And what is the future? What is likely to be his responses? This makes it very interesting because in the end, I would like to uh, give in brief, though it's a detailed analysis worth a separate uh, project in itself, but just gives three scenarios and what could be possible and how it is going to impact all of us. Because China is so strong today that anything that happens there, it is the workshop of the world, global workshop. It's not just factories, the R&D, everything is there. What happens there impacts all of us. So that is why everybody is very keen to know what will happen. So without much ado, I will start off with the part three on Xi era. Hmm. Now comes the Xi Jinping and his era of aggressiveness. And that I feel is back to Mao's era of dictatorship. And same megalomania like Mao, that I should be considered the father of everything in China. A battle of leadership. It was Bo Zhilai who was supposed to be anointed, a princeling. But he spoiled the game by trying to create a Chongqing uh, clique. He, he was the head of the C, uh, Communist Party in Chongqing. He was doing very well economically that had become the fastest growing province. But that happened. And of course, Neil Hayward's murder and other things, everything piled up with mm -hmm. his wife and he got sidelined. After that, Hu Jintao was very keen to bring in Li Keshang. He was, he's the Communist Youth League person. But what happened in April 2012 upset the apple cart. This is uh, the Scarborough Shoal incident where there was a standoff between the Chinese Coast Guard and the Philippines Navy. Philippines. Mm. And the biggest blunder done by Obama in the history. Where he asked uh, that we can negotiate and made the Philippines Navy vacate that area and did not force the Chinese to go. And the Chinese have occupied it since then. Correct. And the person leading the against the advice of CFL and the others was Xi Jinping as one of the vice presidents in the Politburo. And that brought him into the limelight where he kept telling that the West is weak because they looked at 2008-9 economic fallout as the yeah. West is weak. Mm. And he became the president and Li Keqiang became the premier. So the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> now, this is the famous BRI. Yes. And one thing you would note, all the red lines and the blue line emanates from China. All roads lead to China. Like it is a replica in a larger sphere of uh, world island domination. I would call it a world island as Halford had called it. The Eurasian and African landmass is connected. And uh, you have outlying islands like US and others. All roads lead here. But people need to 
listen, India had already flagged that. It has nothing to do with the growth of anyone else. There are three uh, special economic zones within China. Two were already made. That is one which is around the eastern seaboard. Mm -hmm. There is one uh, uh, near at Khardos, which is near Urumqi which no. was already being used for trade with the Central Asian states. Mm. There are two being developed, one in Kashgar and one in Yunnan. These are the places from where items are going to be sent for trade along these corridors. Mm. Then he has picked up a lot of SEZs along the CPEC, along uh, Hambantota also, Gwadar, Hambantota, and along the Indus in Pakistan, which is phase two of the CPEC, which he wants, most of it is going to be used for agriculture. Okay. Whatever industries that will agriculture for supplying to China. Because China is uh, not, it's not food independent, it is food dependent. dependent. It imports a lot of food. Because unfortunately for China, though its landmass is much bigger than India, the arable land is much less than India. Only 7% of its total land is arable. So that is the revenge of geography again it faces. <laughs> the other industries that it is wanting to establish in the SEZ is the low-end industries which it wants to vacate from the eastern seaboard because it wants to start doing high-end manufacturing. That is what is making China 2025 all about. Ah, okay. You need space. Hmm. So the low-end industries can be brought out to these SEZs and to these uh, other SEZs that he intends to buy at a later stage. And space is available where the high-end could have come there. I say could have because there is many a slip between the cup and the lip. So the BRI exactly has uh, turned out to be like an octopus. An octopus has many suction rings and it sucks out the blood. Here it sucks out the eco economic life from the country. And like the octopus, it has eight legs. And here they are. You have the Eurasian land bridge via Kazakhstan. China, Mongolia, Russia, you have the Central Asia, West Asia is the number three. You have the uh, Indonesian Peninsula, which is going to the Southeast Asia. You had uh, the China, Myanmar economic corridor, which is number five, CPEC, which is number six. And the latest is the China, Nepal economic oh. corridor, mm -hmm. which he calls the Trans Himalayan economic corridor. Okay. And the eighth is the Maritime Silk Route. Octopus has eight legs, the BRI has eight legs, and it will suck you dry. But more uh, damaging than the BRI is that the digital Silk Route runs along with it. Mm -hmm. And China has set its own standards for the Silk Route, digital Silk Route, its own internet protocol. So like the shadow institutions, he is creating a shadow internet organization. And along with it comes the surveillance, data surveillance and all the surveillance equipment for the people, ostensibly for the government to control the, its people and get to know in advance what uh, turbulence is going to take place, but also for the Chinese, because the servers are in China, for them to know that whether an anti-government is going to come into place and how with reflexive control to sort that out. As you see, we keep why does the Navy keep talking about the Chinese forays into the Indian Ocean? Just have a look at it. Sri Lanka, Maldives and the Chagos Archipelago. Whoever controls this, if a power inimical to you comes and controls this, your navies are split. Mm. The, two, two Bay, uh, the Bangkok, your uh, Bay of Bengal, Arabian Sea. Chagos is with the British, they have given it to the Americans. 
that's where the Digo Garsha base is. Uh, Chinese had sponsored Mauritius to uh, appeal in the Indian Ocean that it is in their AOR and the Britishers didn't give it to them when they left. And they are fighting their case in the UN to get it back. Indians, while have not said anything against their case, have told them that even if you take it, you should do the deal with the Americans and let the Americans be here. It's a victualing base. There are a lot of uh, old uh, Second World War fort, uh, airfields there, like in the Maldives, in the southern islands, uh, Ghan, if I remember correctly, mm. there is a Second World War airfield out there. Okay. So the Chinese are, even if Chagos is not there with them, they are very interested in securing a foothold both in Sri Lanka and the Maldives. So they are very keen to take over the areas which are of interest to them. But then it is very inimical to us, our Navy. Mm -hmm. Here you can see in the map that thin line which comes below uh, Bangkok. Thailand, which joins Malay Peninsula. Okay, that, is, uh, that area is known as the Kra Isthmus. That's where the Kra Canal the Chinese have proposed to the Thais, which at the moment is on the back burner. The Thai, Thailand uh, arm, armed forces are not interested because the southern portion uh, of Thailand in that uh, Kra area uh, has uh, Muslim separatists. And they are worried that they will uh, break away and join Malaysia. But the Chi uh, Chinese are very keen to make this Kra Peninsula to overcome the Malacca Straits. Malacca dilemma. Okay. So you have in Myanmar, you already have control of Cocoa Islands. In Cambodia, the Riam Naval Base you are making, which is when you come out of the Kra Peninsula into the Gulf of Thailand, that is the main naval base. That's right there. Both sides, you will control. Concurrently, they are already in talks with Egypt, either to widen the Suez Canal or to make an alternate parallel canals, which can take the latest generation, your uh, large container ships, hmm. which can't go through the uh, Suez Canal. Hmm. Sorry, Suez Canal. No, which can't go through this. Hmm. They are also in talks in Panama Canal. And we talks with Nicaragua to make a canal, to counter the Panama Canal, by the way. So their vision is very large. Okay, so this is the importance of, for us, what he's doing. And of course, he's coming on to the flanks that is there, but this is crucial. Whoever holds, if we have this, then we are working on interior lines, as they say, from inside you're going out. If you don't have it, you have to go all the way down into the South Indian Ocean to come up. Around your movement of ships. Yeah, no, that, yeah hmm. around all this. Okay, so it becomes an issue. Then comes just before the second uh, term. That is when you are supposed to put in your successors in place. Sunjankai was, uh, sorry for the spelling, Z-H-E-N. Sunjankai was supposed to be his successor, purged, along with Fang Fangu. He had just made him, he was very close to him. He thought he is close to him. He made him the Joint uh, Chiefs of Staff, head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Department when the restructuring took place. But he felt that he and Sunjankai were too close. And Zhang Yang, who was the head of the political works department. These three were purged. Zhang Yang, of course, he committed suicide so that his uh, family can keep getting his pension. Okay. So that he was already working even before that for his third term and beyond. So he came into his third term, which has been, because at, uh, first term was all success, the rise. Third term initially was a rise, but then became very, very contentious. Those people even then started worrying 
on these points excessive centralization of power all the leading small groups for making decisions which had been visualized by uh, tang shaoping everything was headed by him even for economic which is the uh, leading small group on economy which was usually headed by the premier he sidelined him and he became the head so they had moved away from co collective decision making then came of course the trade war with the us but along with that the wuhan covid virus and its handling the manner in which it was handled left a lot to be desired and then came the negative international standing not only due to the wolf warriorism where they tried to be very aggressive against taking blame for the wuhan covid virus but also the debt trap started emerging sri lanka pakistan myanmar they were all having problems zambia kenya gambia they all started facing problems now because he closed down everything due to his zero covid policy there was an economic downslide uh, not only is zero covid because he invested so much of money into the bri with nothing came back out of it uh, now the economy started sliding and that was the uh, deal with the public which had been taken by tang shaoping after the tiananmen square that you will not talk of anything you will uh, let us do what we want we will ensure economic prosperity for you that was the deal with the people and now that became a downslide when i had visited china changdu and beijing in 2018 a lot of local people were worried because they said that uh, they have seen the downside when they were young the economy was floundering and now they have the money but the younger generation born in the late 80s they have not seen what hard economic hardship is and they are used to a good way of life a kind of economy they are used to and they don't know how they will react if they don't have money in their hands so it's a major worry for a lot of scholars whom i met in sichuan university in changdu in beijing that they were only talking about this worry then came the downward spiral in relations with india with us and with europe mm. his 16 plus 1 he added 17 plus 1 it's all getting stalled yeah and the last point is the ukraine conflict and is uh, while india has remained new, neutral and the number of countries who have been neutral china has given unbridled support to russia little realizing that their economic interdependency is not as much with russia as with the west 85% of the 80 to 85% of their economy is dependent on the export to the west russia is there only for the natural resource and oil and gas and you are already shifting into a green environment how long can you sustain on that uh, fossil fuel indeed so there is a lot of chatter which is going on within china also today about uh, she's unbridled support to russia so now we come to the most interesting period of all the 20th congress which will take place in october this year what happens so i had worked out and written earlier on three options i'll just go one by one first is he is back with full power because he is after all filled up every place with his people the latest promotions that he has done across the board even in the army are people who have served with him in zhejiang and uh, fujian so there is a lot of chatter on that also but the negative aspect is china will descend into dictatorship and such an aggressiveness of g may have a direct impact on the supply chain hub and, and the r&d hub people may start shifting and this will be uh, the when they do the shifting it doesn't happen immediately because you got to set the environment in the place where you are going to set up this supply chain 
and one of the lessons in covid has been diversification you should not be dependent on one hub so let us be clear a lot of chatter is there that from china the entire hub will come to india no it will not come to india some portion of it will come to india some will go elsewhere so they are going to diversify that is one of the major lessons that has been learned from covid and number two china's aggressiveness so it is not your intent it's your capability that is important because intent can change at any time and that's what happened with china mm. so it's uh, harmful uh, for china in the medium to long term so this is the negative aspect of this option next is that he is brought back but with clipped wings because after all uh, he has removed the term for chairman people mistake they say president vice president there is no appointment in china of the term uh, which is called president or vice president it is chairman and vice chairman and you have a premier and the general secretary of the party the most powerful men are the general secretary of the party the chairman of the cmc and the premier the chairman per se of the state is a uh, rubber head he doesn't have the power the power comes from being the chairman of the cmc and the general secretary of the party because you hold control the weapon and you control the party organs there there is nothing given about the terms okay. are they going to bring in a general secretary make him a chairman in what manner are they going to do it that depends on the party leadership and the party elders but what will happen is uh, it will present a mellow front of china but that is also a deception but they will continue with their dream gradually like what they did earlier so the targets that xi may have set up may get delayed but that doesn't mean the target has shifted no the process will continue so they they might feel that this is a win win situation for them win in the near to medium term and win in the medium to long term when china says win win it's always a win win for china win in the near to medium terms and win in the medium to long term so the last is g is sacked it has a negative impact on national aspirations it is least desirable as far as china is concerned is i feel is less likely because there is likelihood of a loss of face for cbc and they would not like that so they may not sack him so my assessment i could be wrong on the possible outcome is most likely is the number 2 that he comes back but his wings are clipped somebody is placed there there are a number of people available in the uh, politburo who are from the seventh generation there are some in the central committee who are from the sixth generation somebody may be placed there along with him as the general secretary i don't know in what manner they will do but i feel his wings may be clipped the next is he comes back with full power he can may bulldoze his way and the least likely is that she is sacked but like i said whatever the outcome the grand strategy is not going to change one bit and the immediate aim whatever be the option the immediate aim will be to disrupt the dispersion of the supply and r&d chains from china create situations in those countries the target countries where they feel it might go create such an environment out there that the mnc's and other countries hesitate to invest there to show that country in a bad light that will take place and that will be the security challenge for those countries india included india included it will happen so this is what i had to say So thank you so much for this comprehensive roundup and let me just say the three scenarios that you bring about on Xi Jinping's future it is critical and much debated across the world as to what is going to happen to the strong man or the king or the modern king of China as i like to call him uh he's faced with a tough challenge tough challengers and a lot of foreign pressure if i may say this the war in ukraine doesn't help either 
I'd like to actually, you know, inform all the viewers, there is something that is hidden behind the smoke screen that we are going to tell you right now is I am trying to uh, force General Narayan into briefing us and taking us through various strategies that India can evolve and to use to counter China. It is not just a military, it is not singularly economic, it is not singularly anything else. It has to be a combination of efforts. But these strategies is something that we're going to talk about in a video which is going to come up very shortly and in detail and in depth analysis of each one of these strategies for us to understand where we are today, what we need to do, and what results would these strategies give us. Thank you so much, sir, for agreeing to this entire series of a study of China, because it is, I think, as you said in the beginning, the most important country around, and anything that happens within China affects all of us. Till next time, Jai Hind, sir. Jai, thank you so much.